Solomon's book of Proverbs 14, 34, which reads, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. On behalf of our host and main initiative, it is my privilege, humble privilege, to welcome each and every one of you here to this launching ceremony of the Leaders Arise Nagaland. And in the same vein, it is our pleasure also to welcome our honored chief guests, Sir T.R. Zilia, Chief Minister of Nagaland, Dr. S.C. Jamir, the Governor of Odisha and former Chief Minister of Nagaland, and the hosts of the luminaries, each in your own right, leaders of your own, in your own right, and also of the organizations that you represent. It is our pleasure to welcome each and every one of you, and we hope that the deliberations that will follow in the course of the discussions that begin the launch of the Leaders Arise Nagaland. We wish to make a small statement that every invitee today has had a very personal uh, link with the main initiator, Reverend Apostle Reverend Lolo Yimson, in the course of his interactions with leaders from Nagaland, right since the early days, since, uh, in fact, his first interaction with the government was on 33rd of March 2001 with the then Chief Minister of Nagaland, seated here today as the governor of Odisha, Dr. S. C. Jabir. The journey began on the 23rd of March, 2001. Since then, it has continued with uh, another program that was hosted by the, the then Chief Minister of Nagaland four years ago, Mr. Nifi Rio. Last week, with the Honorable Chief Minister of Nagaland, Mr. T.R. Zilian. And the continuing relationship with the people that he has interacted with ever since that beginning of the journey in 2001. So it is um, a very exclusive invitation that has been given to each and every one of you. And we would also request that this, this exclusive uh, invitation also not be mis uh, misinterpreted for not being all inclusive. And that the leaders arise in Nagaland would in future, in the course of all the activities that are generated through the launching of this particular uh, association. It would begin the journey of trying to make it all encompassing because every leader has something to say and something to guide our people because Nagaland as has been interpreted by the organizers. Drawing strength, again, like the verse that we read out, it is the need for good leaders in high demand and godly leaders in short supply. And that, with that understanding and using that as the base for working towards guiding Nagaland to a better future. And that is the introductory note that I would like to sort of welcome each and every one of you again with an open heart and with open arms. That each and every representative here has a voice that needs to be heard. And with that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Reverend Anju Kekum, the General Secretary of the NBCC, to help us begin our proceedings with the greetings and the invocation prayer. First of all, I bring greetings from Nagaland Baptist Church Council in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I believe that when we say leaders, especially the state leaders, there are no other people besides us. Whether good or bad, the responsibilities, and all the criticisms, all the praises, we have to swallow it. And before I pray, I want to bring a thought, which all of us should not digest at home also. Many times at home, when I am, I lie down on bed, even in the journey, I think about our spiritual condition of Nagaland, especially the leaders and people. 
let me tell you that this is worth thinking so that we can help the people through our lives. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 said, in the first century, when revival broke out among the people, when few people preached the gospel, when the Holy Spirit moved among them, it is said that many accepted Jesus Christ. And one point it is said, Acts chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 people who heard the message were baptized and added to the group or to the church. A mass group, a conversion that you can see. If I think of this one, we think of Nagali. When Christianity came and when the message went out to different villages, many were added. Some places persecution took place and they were chased out. Nevertheless, in many places, once the chief of the village came to know the gospel, <coughs> at that time the yearning was for the peace, stopping up head hunting between the villages. They had enemies, so they wanted to stop that. That was the yearning. Not only that the message God worked in the uh, Holy Spirit works in their life, and once the leader said, "Let us become Christian," many followed, and it is called mass conversion also or community conversion. Such thing happened. Second wave was here and there in the 50s, the 60s, and particularly in the 70s, revival broke out. At that time, those whoever attended the revival, there was no one who will say that I am not a Christian or I am not saved. Everybody confessed. Similarly, it happened in the Old and New Testament. But when we look at the here and then, and especially in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. The king asked Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, Abinago to worship his statue. But he, he said, we will not do it. If our God wants to save us, he will save us. Even if he doesn't save us, we will not worship you except our God. He stood the test before the king the almighty king of the land and they did not compromise here comes the difference in Nagaland whether in the government or in the church we are very good in community life when we talk about the whole Nagas to show up to the world we can do overnight we are excellent in this no People in the world can beat this one. In 12 hours or even overnight, we can change the things and people praise us. And so, oh, it's wonderful, very good. In fact, of course, we are uh, talented, especially like singing and speaking. In the, similarly, in the church, we are excellent in corporate worship. We are very good in community life. We can act like angels in our group when we are gathered together. Sometimes even in re revival hour. The unfortunate thing is, now we have to retrospect in Nagaland is our individual life. The private lives. Whether we are in Delhi or Switzerland, New York, Bangalore, anywhere. Or at home or in our local church worshiping on Sundays. If we want to be a true Christian, we have to be the same person. Even in the sky, when we fly in the jet, we have to be the same person. Not only that, we have to be the same person in the office when we hold the pen and keep our signature for anything. When we handle the money matter, whatever it may be, we have to be the same person. We can no longer act a double standard life. Because this matters. The whole Nagas, what we do, impact the lives of the whole Nagas. Second, after all, it matters the eternity. Our eternity. Don't take it lightly. Let us not take it lightly. 
but it is a matter of eternity. I would say that community belief, community life is good, but at the same time, rather it should come out from the individual life, not otherwise. We try to have a community good show up and good faith, good singing, good prayer together, and try to impose that in our individual life. But that is not true. Our individual life is deeply rooted in the scripture, prayer, no matter what comes, willing to sacrifice our position, our life also for the sake of our eternity and our faith, then comes out the whole affairs of the world, of the church also. I'm not speaking just to the people who are running the government, but I always speak in the church, shout to the people, particularly the church leaders, where is our individual faith? How where is our personal faith? Everything should come out of a personal life, then everything will be good without imposing from outside. So this is a small thought that I want to leave with you. Where is our private life and where is our corporate life? Do they met, match together? This is something that we need to ponder about. And if we retrospect on this and try our best to look at ourselves and make an amend on this one, I believe things will change in our life. Many things will change automatically. <laughs> We don't have to strive. And this is what I'm yearning for. It is my personal thought. It is my personal observations. And it is a challenge to me personally. And it speaks to me all the time. And let us keep this thought in our hearts. And even as we talk about the scripture, the teaching and discussion, sharing, may we look to God and may the Holy Spirit speak to each and every one of us internally, personally, so that we can respond to him positively. Let us pray. <laughs> Our gracious Lord, loving Heavenly Father, at this time, <clears throat> in this age, Lord, you have raised leaders in Magdalene. And here we are, though unworthy, you have appointed, you have called us and even you have anointed us to be leaders. Even for one day, one year, five years, ten years, even for life. I thank you for these leaders, speaking from our elders, leader, honorable governor of Odisha, down to the youngest leader here. Lord, we are here not by chance, but because you have called us. No matter what position we hold, no matter in what profession we are in, Lord, you have called us. It is said that you have ordained us to that position. What a privilege, but at the same time, what an awful responsibility, awesome responsibility, <clears throat> fearful task that we have before us. What we do can damage the whole state. What can we do can remake and bring many people to the blessings. Lord, help us to know these overwhelming responsibilities that we have. And here we are, today we have come before you to listen to your voice, speak to us individually, personally. Lord, help us to ponder upon our lives together as well as alone. May we be acceptable to you. May we turn to you. May we cry unto you. Ask for your forgiveness. <clears throat> then Lord, commit ourselves to live a life that will be righteous, that will be holy, that will be just, and that will be acceptable before you. Help us and guide us. We commit this whole session into your care. And I pray for all the leaders that you will bless them in such a way that the Holy Spirit will work in a wonderful way so that we can see the changes in our land and our lives. We thank you for this opportunity. 
We commit this whole session into your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Inviting our Honorable Chief Guest, Fritya Zila, and Chief Minister of Nagaland, to kindly launch the Leaders Arise Nagaland and exhort the audience here today. Sir. I'm delighted to be in your midst today, to be part of the official launching of Leaders Arise Nagaland. First of all, let me express my word of appreciation to Reverend Lolehu Imsong, at whose initiative this program is being organized here. After spending several years of useful and practical experience in Australia, he has come back to our state with a mission backed up by new and innovative concepts and approaches to transform our society. I also appreciate his genuine concern for the leaders in Nagaland and for having had several transformative sessions with the political leaders, the bureaucracy, the church leaders, and leaders of civil society without charging any fees. I know there are many experts or resource persons in the field of motivational and transformative training who used to charge hefty fees for each session. You know, be it leaders or officers or public in Nagaland, we have experienced that Naga people hate procedure and system. Without system, we feel comfortable. When a system is introduced, we feel uncomfortable and we don't like the system. That is how in one, this is one area where we could not grow. For example, even the politician, ministers or parliamentary secretaries or MLAs, sometimes we carry the file straight away to officers and we want works to be done without any procedure. See, this is what we want. <clears throat> Say, for example, NCS officers are here. The associate president I can see. When we move on the procedure, everything runs smoothly. And it ends up smoothly without any mistake. But officers' responsibility also sometimes we forget. What is the responsibility of an officer sitting in the chair? <coughs> They keep the file pending for days together, weeks together, they don't bother. What is going wrong in the office? This is how we neglect the system. If we respect the system, one day absent in office, he can always entrust the next officer to carry out the process, the, the works. But one officer absent in the office kept the whole system safe immovable and uh, stagnant. The procedure could not. So now today, we need to change our mindset that system can change everybody. System can make everybody comfortable. If we don't follow the system, then the society and the people cannot grow as we expect. I believe that Leaders Arise Nagaland is essentially aimed at the youth with the objective of building up a group of youthful leaders to take the state and its people forward. 
on a faster track of progress and development. And I think there is a lot of sense and purpose in this program. During our school and college days, we were told that the students are leaders of tomorrow. However, these days, it would not be wrong to say that students and youth are not only leaders of tomorrow, but they are already leaders of today's world. They may not be leaders in the sense of occupying the top political and bureaucratic position, but nevertheless, they are drivers, drivers, fast-changing society and its value system in this global, globalized world. They do this by dominating the internet highways and the social media such as SMS, Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp, etc. And through this media, they can set the tone and agenda for many changes and social reforms. The famous Arab Springs, as well as the recent Modi wave that resulted in the spectacular electoral big victory of the BJP are considered to be some of such examples of the influence of social media, which is mostly dominated by the talented youth. I would definite, definitely like young leaders to arise in Nagaland who should set new agendas of social change through the process of changing our mindset. In my opinion, some of the areas where the much needed change has to take place, I would like to underline only a few points. Before I go into that, I'd like to cite just an example of South Korea. A few years back, as Parliamentary Affairs Minister, I took uh, <coughs> seven, eight of the <coughs> legislators to South Korea. And we were taken to farmers' training school. There we behave like students of farmers' uh, school. We were asked to behave like students. We were taken to this kind of conference hall and they gave PowerPoint pre presentation about civilization of South Korea, how they have started and where they are. There, we have come across that South Korean people, they have faced 33 war in their country. And the people were placed that poorest of the poor. They have nothing to eat. They have no place to shelter. And the country became so poor because of those 33 war faced by the people. But after that, they have realized and there was a people movement that South Korean people should work. Each citizen should work. No one should stay idle. That was a resolution passed by the people, not by the government, not by any other imposition. Mm -hmm. But people took a decision that we must work. So from there, the farmers' training school started. And every citizen come to participate in that uh, training school. And today, even US Army, they used to come and have training in that school. Thereby, people started working and the civilization changes and they could arrive now to one of the advanced country in the world. It is not by anybody but people decision. And the people decided to work, no one to stay, to stay idle. Because they have faced so many crises in life and they have realized that they have to work. I think this kind of resolution, this kind of 
attitude can change our people. But most of all, we have to change our mindset. Unless we change our mindset, any kind of orders, any kind of notification cannot change the lifestyle of our people. In our attitude and mindset towards manual work, especially construction work, at present, there appears to be a peculiar mind blocked towards taking up manual, manual work, particularly construction works, construction works. This has to change. If we are to grow and survive as people, I think there is no developed or developing country where construction workers are almost totally outsourced as it is being done here in Nagaland. Almost every day we hear from our youth the dangers posed by the influx of illegal immigrants to our state. Therefore, in my view, the best way to counter this threat is to urgently build up our own local construction workforce. At present, we are lucky that almost every inch of Nagaland is still in the position of Nagas. Only after we are prepared to take over the construction work, then we'll be able to deal with the problem of illegal immigration more effectively. Here, what we need is change of the wrong mindset, which I believe should start with the youth and be spearheaded by the youthful leaders of Nagaland. For example, in the recent uh, past, when I was planning minister, under capacity building, we have selected uh, more than 500 youth to be sent outside the state to undergo <coughs> training in various uh, disciplines. Here, the Department of Planning alone could not coordinate to various academies outside the state. But fortunately, the youth net of Nagaland came forward to help the department. They used to go and see the academy, the standard of the academy, come back and report, and the selected candidates were taken with the help of the youth net by train, by road, by air. Selflessly, they have helped the government and the youth those who were sent for training, they were comfortable and they were placed properly. And today, more than during this uh, four or five years period, more than 1,000 youth working outside the state after they complete their training. The agreement was made that after completion of training, there must be a placement. Without that guarantee, we will not send any boys and girls. That was our condition. And the uh, Different academy came forward with agreeing with that condition. And today more than 1,000 boys and girls are working outside. Not only government, but the youth net who came forward to assist the government and the youth has, they have done a lot and it has extended great help to the people and to the government. Such should be taken as example and we should try to adopt more policies and program of such NGOs. Awareness about climate change and the green movement is another area of serious concern where the youth who have the maximum stake have to take the bull by the horns. This can best be achieved through the adoption of simple living and high thinking, which has enormous relevance in this increasingly consumer world. 
let us let us remember that only the quality of life but even the survival of mankind in this planet is at stake preservation of ecological balance including conservation of flora and fauna are the areas where the rise of youthful leadership is most needed and will be most effective. All these required change of mindset and our value system. Let me cite one example. In Mizoram, on the initiative taken by the Young Mizo Association, the bursting of fire crackers during any celebration, be it Christmas, New Year, Diwali, or Jubilee, have been stopped by the people of Mizoram for the last four to five years. Without any use of force or enforcement by the governmental agencies, I strongly feel that the mindless pollution of our year in the in the name of festivals or celebration have to be stopped. Not to speak of the needless expenditure involved in it. I'm sure we can do it here too, provided the right leaders arise to start the movement. The people of Waka district do have done a similar feat by stopping the slaughter of Amor Falcons. Earning recognition and appreciation from everywhere, including abroad. Here I would like to also mention one NGO who are seriously involved from the beginning. Nagala people do not know from where these Amur Falcons used to come to our land. But we slaughter, we kill, and we enjoy the meat. That's all. But with the initiative of Nagaland Wildlife and Biodiversity Conservation Trust, headed by Ms. Bado Haralu. They went to Waka district and tried to convince that uh, village, village council to preserve these birds. Because we need to research from where these birds come and how they go away. So they started the research on this. And Pangti village was convinced that they will they'll stop killing these birds and preserve these birds. So they preserved that area for the birds. And surrounding village also, they, they become aware. Awareness was created in that area. And today, lakhs and lakhs of Amar Falcons comes to Waka district in that Pangti village area. And today it has been declared that the capital of Amor Falcon in the world. We get Amor Falcon in other parts of the world, but not as big as the crowd comes to Shuwaka district. So today they have declared that this has become the capital of Amor Falcon in the world. See, this is one, one exciting example that we just come to our land with the initiative of a small group of people who managed to convince the village council. So such initiative is required now to change the mindset of our people and to transform our society into a better society. Only a few days back, Germany celebrated 25 anniversary of the fall of Berlin Wall. 
that had also heralded the fall of communication com commun communism across Eastern Europe and in other parts of the world. What is worth noting here is that it was not the military might of NATO and the Western world that brought down the wall. Rather, it was the power of the German people, particularly the younger generation, who were tired and angry with the artificial division of their people by such a war. It must also be noted that in all such movements, the trigger is pressed by a band of dedicated leaders to, to start the ball rolling. Once the ball gets start, once the ball gets uh, rolling, it has the capacity to pick up its own momentum and become a mass movement. These are only examples, and there are many other areas where we need such a wind of change to blow. That is what I presume the leaders arise Nagale is aiming at. And I wish them the best in their mission to start such a mass social movement aimed at reforming our society. Thank you and may God bless you. We cannot put value to experience and the richness of 
the guidance that we can receive <coughs> through that experience. It is our pleasure to invite Dr. S.C. Jamir, Honorable Governor of Nagaland and former Chief Minister of Nagaland. My dear friends, I take it a very rare opportunity to speak to you about my mind. Since I just asked to exhort the audience, I would like to speak frankly, honestly, and without any inhibition whatsoever. At the outset, may I take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Reverend Yim Song and his co-workers for having brought all the leaders of Nagaland to this platform. And this is a rare occasion for the leaders of Nagaland and therefore we should use this opportunity in exchanging our honest views, our sincere views, and highlight what really are the problems we are being faced today. I am not going to sermonize you, but I want to highlight some of the issues, some of the problems which we are really facing today. And in the course of my discourse, while highlighting the real facts which is updating in our country, in our land, I think uh, people should not take it otherwise. The theme chosen by the organizer Rise up Nagai people, Nagai leaders. I think this is quite befitting and appropriate under the conditions in which we live. I have also added one subject on this, and I have chosen wake up call for the Nagas. In addition to the agenda you have already outlined, I've also added one subject, wake up call for the Nagas. Why? The organizers are asking us to rise up. Why is it? Are we sleeping? Are we in dormant? Or why should we wake up? And why should we rise up? Why? There are reasons behind this. Very big reasons behind this. The biggest question before us today is how long should we allow our people to be in tormented conditions? How long should we keep our country, our land, our state in dilemma? How long should we enchain our people Today, the people cannot speak out because there is famine of truth. The entire psyche of the people, they are subjugated by fear of God. In other words, fear of psychosis has completely ruined the brave Nagas the courageous Nagas. And today, there is there the truth in our land. And therefore, perhaps, the organizers have in their mind that truth, truth should come out. Even the Bible says, if you know the truth, then this alone can liberate your mind, your ideas, your attitudes, your vision. And today, since we have not been able to know the truth, we are under the domain of this darkness demon. And therefore, a meeting like this is very, very important during which we have to speak out our mind. Not from the lips, but from the mind. Then only we shall be able to diagnose where is the sickness by which 
we are under this condition. And therefore, in the beginning, I would like to appeal to all the speakers that they should open up their minds and speak out from their mind, not from the lips. That is what is needed today. What really are the handicaps or if which we are facing today? I think our mindset. Nagas are too much obsessed with politics. We think that politics is everything. And we have been only talking, talking about politics in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the school, in the church. Wherever we assemble, we only talk about politics, 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 and nothing else. And because of this obsession, extreme obsession of politics, we have forgotten the other aspects of human activity. Economics, we have forgotten. Human resource development, we have forgotten. Our cultural <coughs> development, we have forgotten. Social development, we have forgotten. Except politics, politics. We have put everything in one basket. And today, where do we stand politically? Where is our polity? <laughs> People are mute to speak out. They are mute now. They are afraid to talk out. But may I remind this audience that when we have started our political movement, there was only one organization, Naga National Council. That was a spokes. Naga's spokesperson was from Naga National Council, but. Over the years, it has been multiplied. Now seven groups are here. Even Naga National Council have got three faces, four faces, abnormal. Nothing is normal in Nagaland. Everything is abnormal. Why? There's one goal, that is for the future of the people of Nagaland. The future of the Nagas. Only one goal. But in order to obtain that one goal, we have multiplied only organizations. We call it factions. All of them are talking about Nagas, Nagas. But in the name of Nagas, they are fighting among them. They are killing among them. They are dividing among them. And what is the result today? What is the political status of today for 60 years of Naga movement? What is the political status today? We're landed in a situation where either we can move forward nor backward. We have reached a dead end on 29 February 2012. Even the underground dancer in a big congregation in Dimapur, they said sovereignty is not possible, integration is not possible. As a matter of fact, that was the greatest funeral, not a political funeral, during the 60 years. They have buried there. That can we expect any solution, satisfactory, honorable solution with an agenda? I don't think we shall be able to have satisfactory, honorable, political solution with an agenda. And this is a fact. It's a political <coughs> fact. But people are afraid to speak out. But I'm speaking out today because people are afraid to speak out. And if this is a status of our political movement, Naga people, the leaders of Nagaland should rise up. That, then where is the alternative agenda? If any solution is to be sought, 
if any settlement needs to be arrived at, there should be agenda. And that agenda should be known by the people themselves. Political issue doesn't discuss in camera. To decide the future of the Naga people, it has to be with the constant involvement of the Naga people. It cannot be hijacked from the people of Nagaland. If we have to decide the future, the people should know what kind of future they are talking about. We are talking about. We are all involved in this. And we are the stakeholders. And if stakeholders do not know what is being discussed for the future, should we remain silent? Rise up! Naga leaders, rise up! We have to ask questions now. Where are we now? But we are not asking. How we have become so timid? How we have become so coward? Not to raise the issue pertaining to your future. It is not only for the present, it is for the future. And if we are not have the courage to ask what is the future of Naga people, then why should you talk about politics? And why are you leaders? Why am I a leader? If we don't have courage to raise this fundamental issue, where are you leading Naga people? So, so. That is one issue which I'd like to raise today. Now, another issue is, what's about our economy? Completely in this area. After 50 years of state, now we are going to celebrate 50 years of assembly on 29th of this month. We have been building up bricks by bricks, bricks by bricks with hard labor. Definitely there is a sea change between 1960 and 2014. The face of Nagaland is different. We have made tremendous changes during this period. But what is the condition now? Governance is very important. If state has to survive, if the people have to survive, we should have a governance which can deliver goods. But today, governors have been shattered in Nagaland. Why? Too many authorities, too many prime ministers, too many presidents, too many agencies. Everyone is giving order. So people are completely confused. Which one is what? And in this kind of dilemma, can you expect a good governance? Very difficult. Police cannot function. Magistrate cannot function. Even for law and order. Minister also here are not free. MLA is also not free. What heaven? What has gone wrong with our people today? There is something basically wrong in the system. And we are responsible for that. Don't blame government of India or outside it. We are responsible for what we are today. And I wish that leaders should rise up now, should recognize, because this is a time to have introspection, retrospection. Unless we know our weakness, unless we know where we fail, then where is the remedy? Remedy is possible only when you can diagnose what is the ailment. And so far we have not been able to devote our time in diagnosing what has gone wrong with us. We are only pointing out that the wrong is that side, that side. No, it is with us, with me, with you, with everybody. So let us first diagnose where things have gone wrong. And that is another issue which I love to highlight today in our country. Nagaland is a part and parcel of Indian Union, the 16th state of the Indian Union. We are following parliamentary system of government. <coughs> And what is the system? The people should run the affairs of their state in their own way, according to their own genius, 
by electing their representative. And what had gone wrong in Nagaland? In electing and choosing their own representative. <coughs> Election has become horrible. Not only horrible, but terrible. I think uh, all the elected members, you'll have nightmare. You have to think about election, it is a nightmare. And who have made this nightmare? The people, the electorate. <coughs> the people they have made, election is a nightmare. It is commercialized. If the people are thinking about tomorrow, then future, you'll definitely choose a person who can have, who can represent them morally, physically, and everything. And those people who have committed for the people, who have committed for an ideology, who have got a vision, people used to choose as their representative. But election manifesto has lost its meaning. People don't ask manifesto, they only ask Money and that also 500 rupee note and 1000 rupee note. <coughs> Below that, devaluation has taken place in Nagaland. During election, tremendous devaluation. Only 5000, 10,000, 20,000 people. If that is so, minor leaders. Can you expect an effective, efficient government? All those people who were elected, they are sent to the assembly by the people gravely injured. Only injured people are in assembly. That is what? Bankrupt. You have disposed of your car. You have disposed of your car. You have disposed of your land. You have disposed of your kitty. And all are assembled in the, this uh, assembly as a bankrupt. And every day those people who have, from whom you have borrowed, they are knocking your door. When? 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 Then you think, what will the legislators think about the people? Is there any space? Is there, is there any time for them to think about the country, the people? No. They will only think about how to repay whatever they have taken. They are not given chance to think about people. By whom? By the people themselves. Because they have sold their votes. <coughs> how church will play in order to enlighten that the precious vote given by God to every citizen should be used in a proper way. Mizoram has done it. They are also Christian. We are also Christian. They have also church leaders. We have also church leaders. <coughs> Can we not go down further to the grassroots and see whether we shall be able to reform the electoral system so that we can have a government where leaders can have sufficient time to design, to fashion the present and the future of the people. Now the people have slaughtered upcoming leaders during elections, so many elections. Those people say, I want to serve the people. At least I have got commitment to be the president of the people, but they are slaughtered already financially, economically, during election. So during all this election, we have only eliminated upcoming leaders of Nagaland. My dear friends, whether you agree with me or not, but I feel that all the good leaders who would have been shining in the state as a good leaders, they have been massacred by the electorate during election because heavy indebtedness that has killed them, that has ruined them. So instead of building up leadership in the, in the state, 
we are destroying leadership in Nagaland. And there are a lot of issues which the churches in particular should seriously think about. It. Now I want to bring one issue. The Nagas live by themselves or Nagas lifted up from themselves. There are two issues. Nagas leave them by themselves. Whatever you want to do, let them do it. And another one is Nagas leave to them. And Nagas led to themselves all these years. What happened? When Nagas are left to themselves, the first thing is my village, my clan, my ranch, my tribe. Nagaland, when we formed the political parties, we thought that tribalism will go, clanism will go, religion will go. But today, now, everything in terms of tribe, in terms of clan, in terms of ranch, we are moving backward, backward, backward. That is why? Because we are living in our make-believe world. Our view is not world view. It is an automatic view. And that has made us dwarf in our thinking, in our vision, in our mindset. We are made, we are completely made dwarf. Why? We are only talking about my tribe, his tribe, our tribe. But no one is talking today about Nagaland. No, no one. And I don't think even this lecture is all of you. You are not talking about Nagaland as a whole. I could see. And that is the most tragic development over the years. We thought that Nagaland will become solid. Nagaland people will grow. And their vision will grow, will grow. But today, <coughs> leaders, whether they're church leaders or NGO leaders or political leaders, everyone is confined only to this uh, their own tribe, their own clan, their own village. What a sad thing it is for us to think about this. Another thing, another development, very negative development is in Nagaland. We know how to criticize, but we know how we don't know how to advise. And this negativism will kill our incentive, our motive, our vision, everything, because we are trying to find fault only in others. Moral armament, there is a song. If you point one finger to others, three or pointing fingers at you also. And I think this is a time that we should also know that there are fault on us also, not only on others. So if Nagas are lifted up from themselves, then you will have world vision, national outlook, huh? world outlook, then even the state outlook. If you can have that one, then only we shall be able to cope with the changes that are taking place in this country and in the world. Whether Nagas would remain or maintain status quo, or we should also choose to move forward <coughs> along with the rest of the people in the country and the world. I think Nagas should move forward. We can remain static. And this is killing us also. Because when you don't only only your nose, then you'll not be able to really look at other nose also. And exactly what Nagaland is doing like this. There was a finance minister of uh, France immediately after uh, the World War II. He goes cabinet and he has got a parable. He said, the world is like a big railway station. And there are many trains in different tracks. Because even in Dimapur, we have Kamarubra Express, Nagaland Express, all are there. 
with big locomotives. And trainers for what? To take the passengers to the destination. But there are some culture who wish I not to change. But it is only when you desire to change, then you can talk about reformation, rejuvenation, huh? reinvention. But there are locomotives who doesn't move at all. Always in the station, in the station. And if the train cannot take you to a destination, there will be no passenger, no use going there because you are not to reach your destination. And our political movement is exactly that locomotive which doesn't move at all. For 60 years it is not moving. Now the question is whether Naga should choose a train which moves and which can take to their destination. And that destination should be decided by the Nagas. Or by which train? Well, would it be Dhammut Express? Or Nagaland Express? Or Shadabdi? Let us choose one train which can reach our destination. And we should also decide what that destination should be. So that the passengers in that train should be able to decide which train should they should choose? So how long are you going to just waiting, waiting, waiting for a locomotive which doesn't move at all? The Naga said, time has come. The Nagaland, Naga people should choose a train which moves, which can take them to a destination. And that destination has to be decided by the Nagas themselves. But the question is, when to move? Timing. It's also very important, and there are four components of timing. One is past, present, immediate future, distant future. And for us, present, immediate future, distant future. These three are very, very important for us. So we should choose these three components. And during this present, we have to move forward and at least we should expect some result in the immediate future. And we should also, whatever we do today in the present, we should, we should also bear fruits in the distant future. That is what I, I want to tell you. Now, for everything there is a season, and the Bible says, Everything during the season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break, a time to build up. And therefore, it is a time to build up for the number of years. It is a land. We call it Nagaland for Christ, Nagaland for Christ. I want to point out a few features which can entitle us to be Nagaland for Christ. We are ashamed of calling ourselves Nagaland for Christ because whatever we do today, whatever is seen in Nagaland, it, it doesn't deserve to be a land for Christ. But if it deserves to be a land for Christ, I have some features, shining features which can make Nagaland for Christ. Number one, we need to dethrone hatred and coronet love. We have only heard coronation of British Queen. But here, instead of hypocrisy, let us remove hypocrisy, dethrone it, and let us coronet love, <coughs> Christian love, <coughs> real love. Secondly, let us dethrone hypocrisy and coronet truthfulness. Let us remove, let us destroy hypocrisy, and let us coronate truthfulness. Let us build up truthfulness. <coughs> Thirdly, let us dethrone violence and coronate peace. We are completely fed up, tired with violence, and it's time to coronate, to crown peace. Let us also dethrone ill will toward others. 
and coronet compassion in our hearts. We are always talking about ill, ill of others, ill of others. Let us remove that one. And let us now create compassion in our hearts. And all this alone can embark on a new <coughs> chapter. We can learn, we can open up a new chapter of understanding, unity, peace, progress, prosperity. And I hope the collective wisdom of the leaders who are assembled here today will be able to design a fashion, a future for the number people. And that future should be brighter, better future for Nagaland. I look forward to a resurrected Nagaland. And it is my prayer that the leaders who are assembled here should give a serious thought to the issues which I have raised today, because these are the most immediate I think, uh, issues, problems, which is critical and which is very important. Thank you. Thank you for your fatherly observation. We now invite Apostle Reverend Lulu Yimson. He was ordained by the INBCC as the 15th Reverend on 12th December 1993. He's had 34 years in the ministry of the Lord in his service. 15 of those years were spent in Singapore, 10 years in Australia, and as I said earlier, his interaction with people and the leadership of Nagaland began on 23rd March 2001, where Dr. S.C. Jamir was the then Chief Minister. He has continued it with an interaction four years ago with the former Chief Minister of Nagaland, Sinifu Rio, and just a week back, the continuing interaction with our Honorable Chief Minister, Mr. T.R. Zilian. And that has sown the seeds of what Leaders Arise Nagaland has sprouted. It is our pleasure to invite Dr. Apostle Reverend Lulu Yimson to kindly lead us into the vision and goals of the Leaders Arise Nagaland. Honorable Chief Minister of Nagaland, Mr. Tia Zilian, Your Excellency, Excellency, the Governor of Odisha, Dr. S. Jamir, and my respected and beloved dear leaders of Nagaland. It is a special day, not for me, not for you, but for the people of Nagaland. Before I share the goals and vision, I just want to share a little bit about myself, how this has come into existence. I've been away from Nagaland as a missionary for 28 years, as I actually say, for 15 years in Singapore, I pastor churches, work with all kinds of people's group, and I'm a ministry of prayer intercession. It was in one such prayer meetings that God impressed my heart to embark on this journey of leadership development. Many Lagas have been to my prayer meetings to preach. I think one such person is Dr. Ruben Papino, who will be coming up to share later. I'm a man of prayer. I believe in a power of prayer. I'm just a simple clergyman. I was a man of tears. Today I'm excited because this tells me and this shows us that none of us can come together. If we are willing, we can come together. I'm a little bit sad emotional because a lot of times and years have been wasted in the past because we were not willing to come together. But let me tell you from the very outset of this meeting, there is hope for nothing. God is still with us. I want to share a little bit of uh, how things happen. Every time I want to do something, something happens to me, very briefly. When I was invited to go and take over a Western congregation in Western Australia 27 years ago, this first came to me. Who am I? Why should I go? Can I? I overcame this, not by mother power, but by the spirit of the living God, as a servant of God, I went and took over a Western congregation. Ten years later, my family relocated ourselves to Australia and were there, as far as I know, for a long term, doing ministries with a global indigenous peoples group from all over the world, especially from the South and Pacific nations. Five years ago, in one of my prayer walks, 
The Lord impressed my heart to do something for the Naga Diasporas. The same thing happened to me. Who am I? Why should I? Can I succeed in this journey? The same thing comes to me today as I stand in front of the Naga leaders this morning. Who am I? Why should I? Can I? I give glory to God. With God, everything is possible. I'm a preacher. I will start preaching. Amen. God is still with our people. So with this one, I'm saying before you. I have embarked this journey purely because of the Nehemiah spirit that came upon me. Nehemiah, Nehemiah was a person like me living in a foreign land. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him when he heard of his land, his people. When the walls of his city, Jerusalem, was broken down and the gates burned in fire. I've been touching other people, 20 years away, away from home physically, but Nagaland has never been away from my heart. I call Nagaland almost two, three times a week. Talk to leaders, some of you are here today. I do that all the time. I sense a real spirit of humility on the, on the side of our dear leader here. I call all kinds of leaders, don't ask me too many questions. One thing about Thierry Zillian, let me tell you honestly. When I talk to him, pray for me, Reverend. Pray for us, Reverend. It is a sign of humility. As leaders, we got to depend on God. Without God, we can do nothing, nothing at all. Nehemiah's spirit. He went over to Jerusalem, the Bible says, out on the, on fifth, after 52 days, the wall came up. In spite of all kinds of mockery and oppositions from all kinds of people. I believe very strongly, with God we can do, yes, we surely can. Not necessarily 52 days, but something I say in my spirit, as I said before you, 52 months. 52 months from today, we will see a resurrected Nagaland. We will see a resurgence Nagaland, a rejuvenated, renovated Nagaland with a new spirit, provided we are willing to come together and put away our differences in humility. Clothe ourselves with the spirit of line of Judah and move forward. As Dr. Jeffrey clearly said, yes, we got to move forward. I work with indigenous people. I tell them all the time and other people. They have a history of being persecuted, rejected by the white minority of uh, majority people today. 200 years ago, the white men came to the land of Australia, persecuted them, used them as targets. Sometimes I tell them, brothers and sisters, the first people of Australia, you're going to forget your past and move on. Don't keep on licking your wood. Lick the word of God. Because wood is toxic. It's not good for you, but tear is good. But lick the word of God, you'll find strength. Today, if we can find ourselves, if we can draw our strength from the word of God, as we often say to claim, Madeline for Christ, we can turn the tide around from being Madeline for crooks today. It is possible. The change begins with you and with me today. 52 days. Yes, it is possible. Let us not use this platform to attack one another, but get ourselves attached to one another with each other. This is the way to go. I encourage you later on, unless there's something very serious that you need to attend to, don't go away, stay back. Because I believe this is not my initiation. I sense so strong the spirit, God is doing something in our days. And today we can have a new beginning for the state of Nagaland. Let me tell you this before I share the, uh, my visions and goals. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 17 says, God let us arise and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. This is the call for Nagaland leaders today. Let us arise and build the walls of Nagaland today. The walls of education, the walls of our political system, the walls of our culture, the walls of our business, the walls of our church, so that we will no longer live in disgrace. With this one, I will just briefly explain the vision and goal of Leaders Arise Nagaland. Today, by the grace of God and with the favor of God, we have officially launched Leaders Arise Nagaland. We've got a website you can log on to later on, leaders.nagaland at gmail.com. My contact number for Nagaland is there, 91, followed by the Australian, my Australian contact number. So you can uh, come to us on that one. And uh, the logo was designed by uh, our dear brother, Mr. Rokobor Vihino. So the young, fine young man, well, very talented young man. And, um, well, the picture says that the Nagaland is a dark spot. They'll be wearing a dark spot, but there's hope in Nagaland because you see multi rising up. Younger generation leaders rising up. So that talks about that. 
And the vision, of course, is, is the, the theme of this, uh, this uh, uh, organization is taken from Proverbs 43, 30, 40, 34, where it says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any person. That's what the, the vision, uh, the theme is about. And good leaders in high demand, godly leaders in low supply. In, more, in one of the morning walks, I felt the Lord was showing me this, uh, this particular thing came upon me. I did not see anything from the, in the sky, but some hardest came to me and said, good leaders are in high demand, but godly leaders in no supply. Very soon, most of you will be invited to meetings, to day after tomorrow's Ahuna, students conferences, Christmas, and you will be telling your people in your respective villages, tribes, and associations, today we need good leaders. But when was the last time you cried and challenged your people, today we need godly leaders in our land. Good leaders are in high demand, but godly leaders in low supply. And this is the reason, one of the reasons that leaders arise has come into existence. Okay, the vision, I think Dr. Jamie has uh, said something about this one, towards a resilient, confident, proactive, wealthier, and healthier Netherlands for all through radical leaders in these critical hours. We are really living in critical hours. We need radical leaders to bring radical change. Time is precious. We cannot just sit back. We have seated for too long. We have waited too many good years. It's about time that we, 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 we move forward because there's an urgency. Time is against us. We're going to move forward. Radical leaders for critical hours. And leadership do leadership. Some, the time has come for us to do a real shifting. A paradigm shift has to take place. Whether you're church leaders like me today, you're going to bring radical change in your church. Whether it's MBCC, Catholic, <coughs> Christian Revival Church, interdimensional. We need radical leaders who will stand up and say, enough is enough. I want to bring change. I'm sick of being a religious leader, a religious clergy, but I want to bring change in my church, in my community, my tribe, my department, my government, whatever it is. So this is what we need. Next, please. The goals will be, okay, I'll take a little bit of time to explain this one. One of the first projects that we want to embark on the Leaders Arise Nagaland will be Leaders Festival. Nagaland is called the land of festivals. We know that. People know that. I've been asked even from overseas people like Australia, UK, your land is called the land of festivals. We have got lots of festivals, festivals coming up and you will be busy. But let me tell you, why not Leaders Festival? This also came to me in one of my prayer, uh, pr prayer time. I felt the Lord was telling me, come up with Leaders Festival, bring all leaders together, be it angels, church, business, students, whatever, bring together and let them have a festive time. And uh, what we will be uh, coming out with is, we will choose a topic, a topic and uh, we'll talk about one, but in order to be, take part in this one, you got to be uh, a representative of your organization. The person cannot just come in as Mr. Angami or Ms. Sema. You have to belong to one organization or one, you know, uh, one body, so that you represent that one and you take part in this list festival. We're looking at having for at least two days festivals. End of the day, we'll have awards given to them. Okay, next one. Category genius, of course, seniors and juniors and topics. We will choose a topic every year. For example, you know, I'm very active on Facebook. Some time back, Mr. Tenton Toy, he posted something on his Facebook and that really uh, somehow uh, uh, touched my spirit so much. Rule by law and rule of law in Nagare. For example, if that is a topic that we're going to talk on, say, next year. Rule by law and rule of law or something about a radical leader for critical hours, something like that. So we'll choose a topic, and on the topic, all these people will speak. And there will be, what we're gonna do is, gold, silver, bronze, medal, etc. will then name after outstanding past and present leaders and pioneers from various backgrounds, example, politicians. In other words, name after all the chief ministers of Nagaland, civil servants, educationists, women, students, entrepreneurs, clergy, sports person, grassroots, media, etc., certificate of participation, etc. These are just some simple things for you to uh, just think about it, that's all. But we'll be coming on with more in detail. Please, thanks. Leaders Arise Motivational Seminars covers all district headquarters, subdivisions, ranges, and regions, present and provide motivational talks, seminars, plus short and intensive trainings when and where needed. Other activities are Organize Leaders Arise, 
charity and music. There's just a foot for thought. Organize lectures by prominent locals and global persons where we bring people from different expertise from different parts of the world to give lectures. Organize leaders walk the talk, walk -a -thon, and more. We'll, we'll organize leaders walk the talk once a year, for example. Invite all kinds of leaders like you today to walk together. End of the walk, we have a meeting, and hopefully something positive will come out of that one. We just leave to the Holy Spirit to guide us. Next, please. Okay, this is something that might interest you as well, uh, of interest to you. Nagaland Center for Strategic Thinkers, NCST, C5, I call it. NCST will be a platform for people like you and me to come together. It's a people's platform where people from different expertise will be invited to be part of this platform. Where we come and brainstorm ideas and it will operate under C5. First, NCST will call a meeting. Then we leaders will converge, converse on brainstorm ideas, convert and convey. Next, please. So what we're going to do is, for example, exchange opinions brainstorm ideas and share passions, and etc. But in order to come to this platform or whatever uh, a center, you have to be invited. Not just anybody can come in, but we'll pray, we'll talk and see who are the people who can contribute to the growth of Nagaland State. So from different experts like medical, science, business, politicians, church, whatever. So you, have, you, will, you will be invited to be part of this one. This NCST will make recommendations send representations and presentations to outstanding individual and groups for inclusions and, impl and implementation locally and globally when necessary. Another one will be host and organize talk shows and debates for individual and groups such as political, church, business, cultural, civil societies, business, youth, women, civil servants, civic, environments, etc. For example, you know, talk shows, when I say talk shows, it's important that we will organize talk shows based um, on different topics from time to time. Where, for example, environment, about business, we are talking about IBI issues, or young, uh, as our chief minister has rightfully say, you know, raising up local people to get into business. So, from time to time, we will do talk shows, which will be a blessing to our people. Okay, network, network and connect with like-minded individuals and groups locally and globally. And something is not this again. What we'll do is the, uh, the great debate, which I call it, prior to the general election, we'll have the great debate between the chief minister and the leader of the opposition, where we would like to telecast you know, all over the state of Nagaland because we have no excuse with IT today with us in Nagaland. Our people have the right to listen and to hear. One thing that I found in Australia, 72 hours before the general election is very crucial for the voters of Australia, like person like me. You know, on the night, at least 90% of Australia will be watching the great debate between the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. And 60 to 70% of the people will make the decision based on the talk. It's amazing. We will not give questions to the Chief Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, but it's random. They are put on the spot and they're asked, and let's see how they behave. It's important that people they do uh, 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 rise up to speak their minds and hearts together like this. Okay. so. It's a, just a little bit of it that I'll share with you, but more details will come out, and today also, the next, I think there's something. Patrons and advisors. The patron of this organization will be the Chief Minister of Nagaland, and uh, uh, Honorable uh, Chief Minister Tiao Zeleng has uh, become the first patron of this one. We thank God for his willingness to be part of this, and we're looking forward to his uh, to seeking advices as well. Advisors, as of now, we have C. Apok Jabir, Ojibwa Yadin from the Lion Post and Dr. Benjamin Liba Ayer, Kriyo Lee Jichu, Maiba Konyak, Robinato Moore, Temjin Toy, Vika Hosu, Yitachu, Yudang Ao, Arto Hamba, Chodiso Sazo, Kiketo Ayes, and Gops Chishi, London, and more will be, I won't use the word inducted, welcome and embrace, and we want to have a strong team. Why do we have so many people? I believe in what the Bible says. The Bible says, in the midst of many advisors, victory is assured. So, we want to have many more people to come and join our team so that we together can make a strong impact on our land. Next please. And today we are launching also our website. So, one of the meetings we have in here, you can go back and log on it. It's very simple, leadersarise.com. That's our website. So, 
It is just a simple one, but we'll come up with all kinds of designs to make it colorful and attractive. So, you know, it's, it's going to be very exciting. So we can look onto this, this one. All our contacts and everything will be in place very soon. So by the time you go back home, if there's power, you will be able to see some of the photos that uh, you know, we've been taking since morning. So this is our website, and we look forward to have more interaction with you. We have also given a, you know, a car sticker. Please stick in the car and promote, uh, you know, let us arrive. So together we can bring changes. Thank you. Is there any more else? No, that's all. All right, so this is just some of the things that I'll share with you. I don't take too much time because I think we've got so much of uh, so many speakers coming up. But in a, a few days and weeks' time, we'll come back to you through our website and through email, whatever. Tomorrow, I'm doing my seminar with the uh, agricultural department. Then on Saturday, uh, on Sunday, I'm with the classic classic clubs, and Monday with the All Gazette Officers Association at Jubilee Hall. And the journey continues until the end of this month. I want to thank you for coming to this meeting, and I look forward to your support and partnership. We have come together. I, I believe very strongly our Papa God is pleased with us. So may God bless you, and we'll, we look forward to make more contact with you in days, weeks, and months, and years to come. Thank you, Watson.